Hello, everybody. Welcome, and thank you for joining in. My name is David Overby. I had the opportunity to share with everybody a few weeks ago, and I'm back. But who am I? Well, I'm a member of Grace Church. I've been with uh, Grace Church for about 10 years now, um, participating in various, various aspects. Um, I am not one of the pastors here, but I do enjoy the opportunity to share with you today a few things that God has showed me and that I've learned um, recently, and I hope that it will be a blessing to you and an encouragement to you as well. So where are we at and what are we going to be talking about? So we're con continuing with a series that we're in right now. The series is called Vital Signs, and we're looking at a number of different components, uh, elements, if you will. You you'll, you'll get the idea as we get into it. Um, but much like a pulse or a heart rate or even your body temperature are observable indicators of our physical health, there's also observable indicators of our spiritual health as well. And not only our health, but of course, it could be also our brothers and sisters, our spiritual brothers and sisters' health as well. And so it's these kind of things that we're talking about uh, through this series. So, you know, with vital signs, when something is off, these vital signs serve as a red flag that something deeper is awry and that attention is required to an issue. And when we learn to recognize the, the root cause of the issue that's, that's being observed, we would know then not only what to adjust in our own heart, speaking in a spiritual sense, but as well where to direct the focus of our brothers and sisters so that they may uh, see success in addressing the things in their own hearts as well. So the whole series is not just about an only entirely introspective, how are my vital signs, but think even bigger picture as well. How are, how are the vital signs of, of my church family doing as well? So a quick recap of the past three weeks. We're on section number four today, and that's what I'll be talking about. But what do we talk about through the series? Well, in the first week, Tress and Patterson shared with us about patience and how unbelief is a root issue there, but that we can challenge it with belief in God's promises. <clears throat> After that, the following week, Paxton shared about bearing with one another in love and the reality that conflicts will arise, but that our new life in Jesus gives us the foundation to work through these things in love, even though they will come. Now, last week, for the third part, Jackson shared about grumbling and complaining and how this is really an assertion of our own authority above God's, but that thankfulness can bring our attention off of ourselves and back onto God where it belongs. So if you missed any of those series, go back and find them online and give them a listen so that you can be caught up on what we're talking about. Okay, so on to part four, which is what we're at today. Today's topic is gentleness. Now, you might be thinking, gentleness? I thought this was a series about vital signs you know, deep internal issues that have potential to wreak havoc if left unchecked. Isn't gentleness more of like a cosmetic concern, uh, something you see from the outside, but it's not that critical to somebody's health. In other words, is gentleness really even that big of a deal? Obviously, we wouldn't be including it in our, in our series if it wasn't a big deal, but we'll, we'll get into why I think that it is a big deal in the scriptures that substantiate that as we go through the lesson today. But before we begin too far into it, I would like to pray that God would bless and use the time. So God, do. Uh, we acknowledge that. Uh, thank you for truth. Lord, thank you that you have provided us with your words, the ability to, to, to see you, to recognize you, to know, um, to know what you're about, what you're doing, what's important to you. Um, and God, thank you that so much of the things that we'll even get to talk about today uh, it can be a blessing to your church body, uh, to your body, the church, and it can be a thing that builds up and strengthens the church, that challenges the church. Um, God, I pray that the, the truth that is in your word will sink home. I pray that the things that need to stick out to people will be the things that stick out to them, um, God, and that you are directing that. Um, I pray that attention is able to be kept on where it's needed, Lord, and, and Jesus, I ask you to build up your church. Uh, through the power of your word uh, with the things that we'll be talking about during this time. So it is in Jesus' name that we pray and ask in confidence. Amen. Okay, so 
So, is gentleness, our topic for this today's lesson, really that big of a deal? All right, before we get into that, though, I did want to lay a foundation with a few definitions. So, uh, stay with me as we get through a few definitions for gentleness. Um, first of all, there are several Greek words that get translated into gentleness um, or gentle in the Bible. Um, but from what I can tell, they all kind of have roughly the same meaning. Um, things like they mean meekness or mildness of disposition, gentleness of spirit, humility, even kindness. So some of those probably, you know, kind of make sense that that would be the definition for gentleness. I will point out that I also notice that some older translations often take those words and translate them as meekness, whereas maybe in some newer translations translate those same, same Greek words as, as gentleness. So just something to be in mind as you're reading um, in, in the coming days, and you want to come across these terms of gentleness or meekness. Now, it's interesting that it seems that we would get the word gentleness in our English vocabulary from the Latin word gentilis, which originally conveyed this idea of inherited nature. And that'll be really important for what we talk about. So Latin word for gentilis originally meant inherited nature. Over time, that kind of morphed and became more of the definition that meant freedom from harshness or violence was the working definition that it evolved into. So I kind of have this mental picture of medieval nobility and high society in which if you were born into it, the inherited nature part, you were taught the ways of civil society and politeness and what have you to the point that the, the things that resulted from the original definition became the new definition. But just a supposition about the origins of the word that we now have in English as gentleness. All that to say, it's interesting that gentleness was not just something you did, but originally anyway, who you were. It was a descriptor of your identity, an identity that produced actions, much like fruit is produced on a tree. So keep that in mind as we go through and um, kind of build on this foundation. A few quick antonyms or opposites to help keep us oriented. Uh, Harshness would be kind of an opposite, or violence, or a proud spirit, and as opposite of the humility definition for gentleness. A few other things. Notice also that gentleness is by nature observable. It's not just something that you feel inside. You might feel that you have a gentle spirit, but gentleness is recognized following an action, and it's characterized by the position of your heart in executing that action. Okay, real quick recap on some of the definitions that we looked at. Original Greek words, meekness, kindness, humility. English word that they chose to use, gentleness. Originally meant inherited nature. Came to mean freedom from harshness or violence. So we could say, just as a working definition, that gentleness is fairly synonymous with kindness, but having an added layer of coming from a humble spirit and even being tied to our identity. All right. So we've tracked down a working definition for gentleness, but we haven't really established why it's significant or yet given it a context. And so that's what we'll be looking at next. Um, so we still have to answer that question, what makes gentleness such a big deal? And that's what we'll look at. So first, the significance of gentleness. Why is gentleness a big deal? Well, I would first point out that the scriptures do seem to make a pretty big deal of it. Let's take a look at a few passages together. If you'll notice in Galatians 5, and 23, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. So right here we see gentleness appearing in the fruits of the Spirit. A good indicator that this is actually a pretty big deal. Let's look at a few other passages to kind of build up this, this point, though. In Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 3, it just says, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And in another passage, 1 Timothy 6, 11, 
It says, but as for you, O man of God, flee these things, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. So we just looked at three passages and all three of them, gentleness makes an appearance. And, and it seems therefore that this is something to be paid attention to. It's in some pretty major passages. So um, let's continue on, but we might ask the question, okay, the scriptures make a big deal of it. It's there, but, but why? Why is it there? So for that, I would say, hear the words of Jesus in Matthew eleven twenty nine. Jesus is speaking and he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Did you notice it? Jesus says, I am gentle and lowly in heart as part of describing himself. So in other words, gentleness is an attribute of God himself. And so that is very much reason for it to be significant. I would also point out that this has direct implications for us as believers. Recall that we were created to be image bearers for God. And according to verses like Colossians 3, 9 through 10, we are to align ourselves with God's image. Therefore, it is fundamentally tied to our identity as followers of Jesus. <clears throat> so, I think it's pretty great that the Latin word gentilis originally meant inherited nature, which for the Christian is our new life in Jesus. And of course, notice also that as gentleness is tied to our new life, our vitality, it is very much a vital sign. Now, it's a positive vital sign, but um, yeah, I just wanted to, to, to make sure that we were able to kind of get that squared away here at the beginning. I would also like to bring out one more point I think makes gentleness a very big deal. Recall how Jesus um, in Matthew qualified hate or hateful speech as having the same severity as murder. At least one way that I can think of in which those two are on the same playing field is that they both assert the value or the inherent human dignity of one individual, the aggressor, over that of another individual, the victim. And I would argue that to be harsh or violent, in other words, to be ungentle, is another form of qualifying human beings into levels of intrinsic worth. Most typically, it would involve elevating our own value above another's in the form of selfish pride. We call humility being one of the definitions for gentleness. Um, and who, I guess basically, where do we get that kind of, who, who, who's given us that kind of authority or who are we to have that, the right to assume that kind of authority? Um, Whereas conversely, gentleness recognizes and even responds to or in accordance with the God-given worth of an individual. And I hope that that will kind of become more clear as we continue to build on some of the scriptures and applications for gentleness. But I wanted to get that as well, just kind of out there to build up this. There's a lot of significance to gentleness and it's tied to some very deep, uh, deep things. So to summarize that little section, gentleness is a big deal because it's an attribute of God, therefore a part of our new identity as believers, and at its core, an acknowledgement of the inherent worth of a human being. To be harsh or ungentle is to either assert one's own fundamental worth as having greater value than another's, or to diminish the intrinsic value of another beneath one's own perceived worth. Okay. So all that's been a little bit intellectual up until this point. What about, you know, talking deeper meanings and definitions? What about practicals? Let's talk about that next. What does gentleness look like in action? And do we have any scriptural examples of it? Because that would be a great place to look, right? Is there any instances of this in scripture that we can turn to? So it turns out we actually have quite a few examples. And I wanted to share those with you guys. And I'll just say, I really enjoyed pulling this list together and seeing all the different contexts where gentleness played a role, it was pretty eye-opening to me to see 
how many contexts gentleness appeared directly in the scriptures. And we'll kind of point that out to you as we go through these couple of verses. So pay close attention to this next part and see if you can catch any examples that really apply to where you are at in your life right now. So first, Galatians 6.1. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch over yourselves, lest you too be tempted. In this example, we see gentleness in the context of believers helping those who are entangled with sin, and it was approached in a manner of gentleness. Look at another passage with me, Ephesians 4.2. Um, maybe it's 4, 1 through 3. But hear, hear, the, hear the word. I therefore, prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. In this example, we see gentleness in the context of supporting unity amongst the body of believers as they are gentle with each other, as they are considering the intrinsic value that God has given to each other in their interactions with each other, in those actions that take place, and is doing that from a spirit of unity and uh, gentleness and humility, there's unity in the body and the body is built up. Let's look at another. In 1 Thessalonians 2.7, But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. And this is regarding the apostles, and they're describing how they interacted with those that they were discipling. In many instances, we ourselves could be in a context where we are discipling or even being discipled by someone else who uh, is helping us grow spiritually. And here we see that context that many of us have experienced, gentleness plays a role. Let's look at another verse, 1 Timothy 3.3. 3. And therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. In this context, we see gentleness in describing the qualifications for an elder, and it's in contrast to being violent, which we looked at previously as one of the antonyms for gentleness. In 1 Timothy 6.11, it says, But as for you, O man of God, flee these things, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. In this instance, we see gentleness as a thing to be pursued. It doesn't just happen, but it's pursued. And it's placed in contrast to attitudes that bring ruin and friction amongst a community. Those were described in the preceding verses, but you could go and look at it for yourself. Continuing on through some of these scriptural examples, again, you're trying to see, or I'm challenged you to see if there's any of these situations that you are in or have been in and how gentleness could play a role. So now we're looking at Titus 3.2. To speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy for, toward all people. In other words, in keeping with our, our gentleness is in keeping with our new identity uh, in the broader section of this passage. And it's something that is profitable and that it's also beneficial for the functioning of the church. And that kind of gets built out a little bit more in the section. But that's the context in which we find the word gentleness, beneficial for the functioning of the church. A couple more. James 3.17. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial, and sincere. In this case, gentleness is an indicator of spiritual wisdom. And it's placed in contrast to worldly perspective that results in disorder. <clears throat> Two more. 1 Peter 3, 3-4. Three through four. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry, or the clothing you wear, 
but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. In this case, of course, uh, the passage is directed towards the women in the church, but it's basically communicating that gentleness is an imperishable mark of beauty in a wife, to use in the specific context, and not only that, but it is precious to God. It is valuable to God who owns everything. The last one I have for us to look at is 1 Peter 3, 14 through 16. It says, But if even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense for anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. I find this one very interesting. The context is that we're given is gentleness is a manner for responding to those who directly oppose the message of Christ. And it has the effect even of humbling the opposition. Okay, so I know that that was quite a list, but consider if any of those, or if you have been in any of those situations yourself. I know two that really did stick out to me where the gentleness, one, it helps us navigate the many interactions within the church body that will be required for it to remain strong and healthy. I also liked how that it demonstrates to non-believers that they can be part of a different kingdom than the one that they know, that they can have a different identity, particularly in that last passage that we looked at. Okay, so... Some scriptural examples of gentleness. What, what maybe could it look like for us? We've talked about sort of a deeper basis and meaning for gentleness. We've looked at some scriptural examples. Um, what are some practical ways to exemplify gentleness, to put it into action? What might it look like? So I pulled together a few things that came to my mind. I bet you could think of some more, but... Uh, why don't we do that? I'll read these and then you can think about if there's anything else that you come, that comes to mind for you or even that you could derive now that you have a working definition for what gentleness really is about. So here's a few things that came to my mind. Um, practically, use a person's name when addressing them. Acknowledge that Acknowledging that they have a name gets to the idea that they are unique and have a unique intrinsic value which we described how harshness was opposed to that purpose. But the gentleness acknowledges that. And so by saying somebody's name, when talking with them, we're saying and communicating, hey, you have value. An example of where I've tried to do that is coming home from work. A lot of times when I work downtown, a lot of times I'll meet people who are out on the streets and they're having hard times. Sometimes I have something I can help them with. Sometimes I might not, but I always ask them, hey, what's your name? This is my name as a reminder that whatever your position is, you have value and you have meaning and you're a person. You have a name. A few other things. Don't withhold praise where it's due. <clears throat> if you thought somebody did something well or thoughtful, <clears throat> let them know. Many times, at least I can say for myself, that pride or fear takes hold and restrains me maybe from saying something encouraging with the thought of, oh, well, they'll become conceited if I, if I say something encouraging or they'll think I'm condescending them or something like that. Don't let that be the case. Like, just go for it. Like, hey, you did this really well. Great job. And um, communicate, communicate that, that phrase in that, gentleness, in that gentle way. Another thing that's also for me personally that sticks out is not to be so quick to defend myself. Somebody brings something up to me or they, challenges, they challenge in some way something that I felt like I did well, and then I'm immediately, in the manner in which I respond, I am harsh. I am in that quick-to-defend attitude. It's not one of, hey, this person talking to me has value, or even a third-party individual that this is about is really important and I desire God's best for them. It's, oh man, my value is, is somehow now at stake here and I have to defend that. And I need to slow down, and any of us who are in those situations, to slow down and acknowledge what's really important in the situation. 
Um, another thing, do not relish the opportunity to make somebody else eat their own words, even if that is what they have to do. And that's kind of just the idea of, again, sort of elevating your status above somebody else. You've, you've won a small victory in an argument or something and you feel high and mighty, like, aha, um, and you're, you're setting now degrees of, of value between the person. Um, you can, in a gentle way, you can acknowledge that, that your position is superior and, and continue to pursue uh, a deeper meaning or value to, to the situation, whatever it may be. Um, a few other things. Be very selective with the words always and never. And I think many times we become hasty with words like that. And in that hastiness, the gentleness is lost. The gentle spirit, the kindness is lost. And there's a, a quickness to like, win an argument or to, to simply the peep the value in a person becomes less than a person that's value and it's more so just they're an obstacle in the way or something like that. So be very careful with and selective with the words never and always. Another practical thing, listen first and then speak. Give yourself a chance to acknowledge what you heard and then in a kind and gentle way in your response, you can now have composed yourself and and deliver in a way that does not provoke to anger or that does not escalate a situation. When you speak, verbally acknowledge that what you heard, uh, verbally acknowledge what you heard before stating your own thoughts or opinions. And this kind of goes along with some of the other things that I mentioned already about just um, giving, allowing the situation to be, to remain calm so that there's not a harshness uh, associated with the situation. And kind of along those lines, um, something you can imagine yourself maybe in a situation like this, but I wrote down, don't just ride the wave of emotion in the room or conversation. If things are getting heated and voices are getting louder, recognize that as your cue to unclench your fists, release the likely growing pressure on your teeth, say a quick prayer to God for strength, and ride an even keel through the raging storm around you. Basically, call upon God for his strength to work through you a spirit of gentleness so that those who are part of and observing the situation, much like um, those who are in opposition to the apostles would see the humble and gentle response and it would be, it would speak volumes and it would humble the situ those who are looking and, and it would exemplify the characteristics and attitudes of Jesus Christ, who's the new source of life within us. <clears throat> okay, so those were just a couple of some practical ways I thought of to exemplify gentleness in some challenging situations that we're very likely to face where we would be tempted to, to be harsh or even violent. I did want to make a few clarifications. We've talked a lot about being gentle and gentleness, but how do you respond to somebody who is towards you ungentle or harsh? I think the answer is you just be gentle. Uh, not to say you can't be firm, but inwardly there is still the humble attitude of desiring that this difficult person would experience God in a way that they clearly aren't in the moment and that God would be either A, that they would know and re respond to God for salvation, but then that also that they would be submitted to him if you're talking with another believer. So don't escalate the situation. If somebody's being ungentle with you, the passages that I've read seem to still communicate the right response is, to be gentle, because there's a bigger purpose in mind. A few things, gentleness is not, just to make some clarifications, gentleness is not being a wimp or a pushover. It's not being a people pleaser or saying yes to everything, even when it would go against your own beliefs or convictions. Go back to the definition and sort of the understanding and the basis for gentleness that we established. It's that heart of humility, that gentle spirit, that desiring the best for the other individual and not an elevation of your status above theirs or, or even diminishing the, the value that God places on you yourself. <clears throat> a question that could be asked, is there ever a time to not be gentle or is there a time to be harsh? 
I would I would argue that from what I see, no, it doesn't look like there is a time to have a proud spirit or to belittle or degrade another person. Um, certainly, as I said, there can be times to be firm and to be clear, but I think it can still be handled in a gentle way that takes into account the bigger picture of the situation and um, a Christ-like perspective that acknowledges our identity, our new identity, our new life in Jesus. All right, so I am said a number of things. I'm kind of wrapping it up now. Um, let's just go back through what we talked about. We talked about a definition for gentleness. Here's one I borrowed. Gentleness or meekness is the opposite of, to self-assertiveness and self-interest. It stems from trust in God's goodness and control over the situation. The gentle person is not occupied with self at all. This is a work of the Holy Spirit, not of the human will, which we saw that when we talked about the fruits of the Spirit. There are things that result from the Spirit at work and the new life that we have, um, much like our, our Latin definition, the inherited uh, meaning. We also talked about the significance of gentleness. What makes it a big deal was the question that we asked, and we showed that it was, A, it was tied to the nature of God, but as image bearers, it was also tied to our new nature in Jesus Christ. And we also saw that gentleness inherently indicates our alignment with God's perspective on human value. And then we looked at a context for, for gentleness, and we saw a number of verses in, across the New Testament in which gentleness was mentioned and several indica- ind- instances in which, it was, in which it was portrayed to be uh, an important thing. So we saw how to interact with other believers, how to respond to persecution, a number of different things in those passages. Okay, so we've talked a lot, a good bit, about gentleness. I've kind of presented in several aspects of it. We even looked at some practical examples of ways to respond in difficult situations. So then the question comes up, um, what, what stuck out to you in, in the things that we talked about? and the things that we went over. And even further than that, taking some time to really think about in light of how important gentleness is, in light of the fact that it is actually a big deal, what am I going to do with that? Are there situations now where I, am, where I find myself being harsh or in some other way or proud? Again, an antonym for the, the humility of gentleness. And how can you bring that different perspective? How can you bring God's perspective of the situation into that? Even inviting others, maybe, who will join you in in supporting of having a gentle response to the situations. So what does that look like? Um, If you're not sure where to start, I would recommend just starting with the prayer to God, um, that God would grow you in a genuine, humble attitude towards others. And as well that um, you would you would ask God to reveal Himself to those around you through the actions of gentleness that would take place in your life. So take a minute, uh, take some time to think about that, and then um, and then that'll be it. God, I thank you for the the truth of your word. Um, I thank you for just the rich meaning in your word, God. I thank you for the breadth of examples that you've given us on this topic. I pray for my own life, God, that you would help me to be uh, growing in expressing actions of gentleness um, through a heart that is also uh, gentle because it understands what your perspective is, God, and it acknowledges how you see people, even in challenging situations. Uh, that come up. I pray for that for myself. And God, I pray that for my brothers and sisters, that they too would experience the blessings um, and the peace of, of, of your spirits at work, producing um, the fruit of gentleness. And I pray that many others would be blessed by it as well, God, as we are submitted to you and allowing this part of who you are to be expressed in our lives. 
In Jesus' name, amen.